Today's scripture is from James chapter 1, verses 17 to 27. Listen for the word of God. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we became a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your lives. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Amen. Today's sermon is entitled, Learning to Be a Disciple, Part 2, and will be delivered by Pastor Stephen Lackis. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The grace and peace of Christ be with all of us today. Every one of us here today, every one of us is a loved child of God. Every one of us here today has been blessed by God. And as part of that blessing, God has given each one of us our own gifts and our own talents. We shouldn't forget how wonderful that is. Sometimes when we're feeling down, we tell ourselves that we aren't so special. We tell ourselves that we're useless, that there's nothing that we can do, nothing that we can contribute to the world. But that's not true. That's not true at all. We are valuable and we are needed. God, in his great love for you and me, gives each of us our own abilities and then he calls us. He calls us to use those abilities, to use those skills that we have to change things to touch this world and to help make it better. That's what it means to be a disciple. To put your hand up and say, I, I am willing. I am willing to use the gifts and the energy that God has given me to help this world to change, to make life better, and to cooperate with Christ in pulling His kingdom into this world. That's the calling that Christ gives to each of us. Not just to be believers, but to be disciples. People willing and ready to follow Him and to work together with Him. That's the topic that we've been focusing on this month. This whole month of September, that's been our topic. How can we become Christ's disciples? How can we put our faith into action? How can we serve God, serve our world, and serve each other? At the start of this month, we looked at the introduction to the letter of James, and we found that James gives us a lot of great tips on living out our faith. Last time, I mentioned that James' introduction gives us six very helpful tips to start us on our discipleship journey. And we already looked at the first two, the first two of those six. The first, in verse 19, was to be ready to listen. We make a positive change in our world and in the lives of others simply by being ready to listen and to understand what others are going through. As disciples, of course, we also need to be ready to listen to Christ and to be sure that we're doing things the way that Christ wants us to do them. 
That led us to the second point in verse 20, which was that the disciples work for God's kingdom by using patience and wisdom, not by using anger and violence. The world tells us that the path of violence is the one that wins. That to make a change, you need the biggest armies, you need an attitude of anger and rage, and that violent power is what pushes things through. But James reminds us that that's not Jesus' way. That's not the way Jesus wants us to do things. Despite the temptations of anger, despite how good it can feel to set free our anger and rage, James tells us directly in verse 20 that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God is wanting. The way Jesus wants us to live our lives is a way disconnected from the angry and violent abuse of others. He wants us to reject abusive actions, to reject abusive words. So those were the first two important points that James gave us for our discipleship life. Today, today we want to continue and look at the last four points. But straight away, as we keep reading through James's introduction, straight away we find that the next point, number three, is a hard one. In verse 21, James tells us that we must get rid of all the filth and evil in our lives. Just hearing those words makes us uncomfortable. We don't like thinking of ourselves that way. We don't like thinking of ourselves as having lives full of filth and evil. But one of the challenges of discipleship is that it forces us to look clearly at our own lives, to look clearly at our own hearts and to see our own problems, not just to focus on the problems outside out in the world. After all, to make the world a better place, we need to first start with us being better people. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be perfect, and it doesn't mean that only the holiest people, only the most sin-free people people can be disciples, because if that was the case, then none of us would have a chance. None of us would qualify to be disciples. We all have problems. We all have failings. We all have sin in our lives. So to be a disciple, we don't need to be perfect, but we do need to be trying. We do need to be working on our failings and trying hard to change them. To put it simply, if our lives are filled with evil, then there's no way that we can be the good and productive disciples that Christ wants us to be. Those problems hold us back. Those problems pull us back, they hold us back, they stop us being the best that we can be. That's why there's a connection. I'm not sure if you ever noticed, but that's why there's a connection between the word disciple and the word discipline. To be a disciple is to work at getting our faith life under control, to live a disciplined life. It's just like with sports, with sports training. If we want to improve our strength, if we want to improve our skills at the gym, then we need to be disciplined. We need to get into good habits. We need to avoid bad attitudes. We need to avoid bad habits and behaviors, all of those things that hold us back and stop us from advancing, stop us from progressing and growing. That's what James is encouraging us to do here with this third point. He doesn't want to tell us this point about filth and evil in our lives to disappoint us. He doesn't want us to think, well, I have too many failings in my character, too many problems with my attitude and my behavior, so I might as well just give up. I might as well just forget about it all and quit. No, that's not what James wants us to do. James is encouraging us here to examine our lives, to see where our problems are, and then to work on making those things better, on being more disciplined as faithful disciples. Because if we aren't trying to do that, if we aren't actively training to put the evil and the problems in our lives behind us, then we're not going to get very far as disciples. So what is it that's holding 
you back? What is it that's stopping you from being the disciple that Jesus is calling you to be? I think just asking that question makes us really uncomfortable. And it's not one that I can answer for you. But I do want to encourage us all to think about that question and to ask ourselves, what is it really in my life? What is it that's stopping me from living the way that Jesus wants me to live? What parts of my life, what aspects of my attitude, of my habits and my behavior are really holding me back, are really hurting me and hurting those around me? As I said, we don't like to ask those types of questions. We don't even really like to think of our failings and our weaknesses. We don't like to admit that we do have bad habits, that we do get caught up in behaviors that are self-destructive. But I want to encourage us all really to be open to God's leading here. I think in times of quietness, if we reflect in our hearts, if we are quiet and listen, I think we recognize that God already speaks to us, to each and every one of us, and encourages us to change something in our lives. But it's only by listening to God's voice. It's only by admitting those problems to ourselves and working at changing them that our lives then really can be touched and healed and changed, that we can start moving again in the right direction. We need to set aside that harmful pride that pretends that we're perfect, that pretends that we're perfectly okay. And instead, as James writes in verse 21, we need to humbly accept the word that God is planting in our hearts. Because it's that word and that call for us to change that has the power to transform our lives and to save them. The fourth lesson, or the fourth tip that James gives us on discipleship is one that we've been talking a lot about this month. That lesson is simply that discipleship must involve action. Discipleship must involve action. To be a disciple really involves more than just listening to God, more than just believing. That's not to say that listening and believing aren't good. They're incredibly important. They're really good to do. We must listen. We must believe. But to be a disciple means going further than that. It means getting the gears of our faith moving and turning. It means putting our faith into action. It means allowing our faith to actually influence the way that we're living our lives every day. To put it another way, disciple, disciple is really a job title. And as a job title, it necessarily involves action. That's why in verse 22, James says to us, Don't just listen to God's Word. Don't just listen. You must do what it says. Otherwise, we're just fooling ourselves. Discipleship is a job title. If I never cook anything, then I can't really call myself a chef. If I never paint anything, I can't really call myself a painter. And if I never put my faith into action... I'm going to have trouble calling myself a disciple. As James says, to do that, well, that would really just be to fool ourselves, to pretend that we, that we are something that we aren't. So disciple is a job title. It involves action. It involves doing something. But what should we do? What is it that we should do if we're disciples? When we sit down and think about this question, it's always really tempting to think that the work that we should do should really be great and impressive. The type of things that make the front pages of the newspaper, the type of things that get people talking. When we start out on our discipleship life, I think we often have that temptation or that desire to really be superheroes of the faith doing great things and turning the whole world upside down. And while I think it's nice, it's nice to have big dreams, we don't really need to be superheroes to be good disciples. In verse 27, James gives us an example of what great discipleship work can involve. 
He writes, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. Something as simple as caring for others. We don't really need a cape. We don't need superpowers. Instead, to be a great disciple, that simply means being helpful, being compassionate, caring in small ways for those around us in need. James mentions looking out for orphans and widows, but that's really just an example. That's not the limit of discipleship work. That's just an example of the things we can do. There's many, many types of work that we can do as, as Christ's disciples. There are many people who need our care and attention. But it's this act of caring for others that is really so important. It's this act of caring for others that does change people's lives. That's something we never really see in superhero movies. We never see superheroes looking after the elderly. We never see Superman serving food to the homeless. We never see Iron Man helping children with their schoolwork. But it's these little types of actions, these little, little things, things that really aren't going to make the front page. These little things, they really do touch people's lives and they really do make a difference. To be disciples of Christ, we don't need to lead a war. We don't need to heroically battle an enemy. The true heroes in our lives are those who reached out to us, those who helped us when we were in need. And that's what Christ is calling us to do, too. True heroes and great disciples are simply those who reach out to others with kindness and compassion, lending a hand and changing lives with words and acts of love. Jesus himself, Jesus himself mentions tiny, tiny acts as simple, of, as, simple as giving someone a cup of cold water. Actions that, in theory, all of us can do, all of us can manage. But that brings us to the fifth point. In our discipleship lives, we need to depend on God's strength, not just on our own. I think it's easy for me to stand here and talk about us living more disciplined lives and us doing little acts of compassion and care and I think we can all agree to that. We can all nod and agree because we understand that. We understand that in theory that's what we should do. And we understand in theory that that's an easy thing to do. The problem is that in practice, we quickly find that it's not so easy at all. The problem is that in practice, to give someone a cup of cold water, to say kind and encouraging words to others... Well, it sounds easy, but we still struggle so much to actually do it. It's not so easy. It's not easy to, to be brave enough to speak to others. It's not easy to ask others if they need help. It's not easy to step out of our comfort zone and approach others, even when we know that it's the right thing to do. We still struggle with that. All of us are sinners. All of us are limited people. And all of us struggle to do what we know is right. So if we only depend on ourselves, if we only depend on our own strength, we're not going to do very well. So often we have good intentions. I think we all know that from experience. So often we start the day with such great intentions. We are determined to do great things, helpful things, wonderful things. We have good intentions, but somehow it just doesn't turn out that way. We just can't get ourselves moving. We can't overcome that inertia that holds us back. We can't turn those good intentions into good actions. That's why it's important that as disciples, we don't just rely on our own strength alone. We don't just have faith in ourselves. Because if we do that, we'll definitely fail. Instead, as disciples, we need to depend on God's strength. We need to depend on God's guidance and support. We need to have faith not in ourselves. We need to have faith in God. Augustine, one of the great teachers of the early church, 
described this as depending on God's cooperative grace. God's cooperative grace. When we do good things, it's not somehow because we're superheroes. It's not somehow because we are great or because we have this ability on our own. On our own, as Jesus teaches us, on our own, we can't manage much at all. But God, God in His grace, God is the one who gives us the strength to cooperate with Him and to do the good works that He wants us to do. In verse 17 of today's text, James describes it this way, reminding us that whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God. It's a gift of God's grace to us. The good works that James encourages us to do and our abilities to help and care for others, they don't really count as ours at all. They're not our talents. They're not our abilities. They're not our good works. They're all a gift from God. God is the one who is already at work changing our world. God is the one already at work transforming our world and transforming our lives too. So God doesn't give this responsibility to us and then just dump that job with us and leave it for us to do on our own or by ourselves. Instead, God offers us His grace, His strength, and His invitation to team up with Him to join hands and cooperate with Him in doing great and wonderful things. So discipleship is an action. Discipleship is a type of job. It's a job where we cooperate with God in changing the world around us. But most importantly, it's a job that we do with love. It's a job that we do with love. That's the sixth and the last point, the sixth and last lesson. In the end, discipleship is simply that, the work of love. When we watch the news and we see a world that's full of problems and disasters, when we see a world that's full of unfairness and suffering, a world where so little seems to be going the way it's supposed to be, it disappoints us, it hurts us. But really, to understand the pain and the brokenness of the world, we hardly need to look outside around us at all. Because we see that pain and we know it already in our hearts, in our own personal experiences. Each of us here knows what it's like to feel broken. We know the tiredness that comes from suffering through the loneliness of life or putting up with the pain and unfairness of it all. We know what it's like to feel trapped by life. We know what it's like to feel trapped by a life that isn't going the right way, the way that we expected it to, the way that we hoped it would develop. And we know that desperate feeling, that hope for something to come and set us free. But what is it that sets us free? The thing that sets us free, the thing that touches our lives and change us, changes us, is the same thing that heals and transforms the world around us. It's the work of love. It's the work of love that sets us free. In our own personal brokenness and disappointment, we want others to reach out to us with love. We want others to share words and actions of love with us. That's what our hearts are waiting for. But that's also what our world is waiting for. This world in its own brokenness and disappointment also needs our acts of love to set it free, to heal it, and to get it moving again in the right direction. In verse 25, James tells us, look carefully into the perfect law because that is what will set you free. But what is this perfect law? What's this perfect law that sets us free? In chapter 2, verse 8, James talks about it again and calls it this time the royal law. And he recites it for us. He tells us what it is. That law is, you shall love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. 
That's the law that sets us free. And that's really what discipleship is all about. It's about taking Christ's royal law of love and putting that into practice. Putting it into practice in our lives, in our relationships with others, and in this world. We do that because we trust Christ and we believe Christ when he tells us that love really is what will set us free, that love is what will change this world for the better, and love is what will lead us to see God's kingdom established here on earth. We believe in love. We act in love. We put our hopes in love, never letting it go, never forgetting it, never abandoning it. Because love is what changes everything. That's why in his introduction to discipleship life, James can pull all of these six points together and sum it all up in this simple statement in verse 25. If you look carefully into the perfect law of love that sets you free, and if you really do what it says, and if you don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Through love, God will bless you. Through love, God will bless the whole world. Today, Jesus is calling us. Today, he's calling us not just to be believers, but also to be doers, to be followers, to be partners with him in loving each other and loving this whole world. He's calling us today to be his disciples. Over this past month, we have been reading through the letter of James and we've seen what it means to be a disciple. We've learned what it means to be a disciple. To be a disciple means being ready to listen. It means turning our backs on the pathway of anger, meanness and violence. Being a disciple means being disciplined to work at overcoming the problems in our own lives. It means being prepared to really act on what we believe. Being a disciple means depending on God's grace and strength, not just depending on our own. And most of all, being a disciple means being brave enough, being brave enough to stand up and work for love in this world. The reason we do this, the reason we put our skills and talents into service in this way is because we know, we know that by doing this, we can touch the lives of those around us and we know that we can help change this world into a greater place, a place of goodness, fairness, compassion, and most importantly, love. Let's pray together. Our Lord Christ, you call us not to give up on this world, not to give up on life or on those around us, but instead to help you in changing this world for the better. You call us to join you in doing the work of love so that your kingdom may truly come into this world. You call us to put our faith into action. Through your grace, give us now the strength and bravery to answer your call. Become the vision and the guiding light of our lives and give us the bravery and the determination to become your disciples today. In your holy name we pray. Amen.